My name is Wouter Hanegraaf. Um, I'm a professor of history of hermetic philosophy and related currents at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, this is a chair that was started uh, in 1999. And it was uh, at that moment the second uh, uh, academic chair in the world for the study of uh, Western esotericism. The first one was in Paris. I was born in Amsterdam, in the same city. My father was a minister, or he was a theologian who became a minister. And um, as happens very often with uh, sons of ministers, sons of ministers have a fascination for religion, they have a special interest in religion, but very often they do not become ministers themselves, but they become historians of religion because they get a kind of historical interest in the phenomenon of religion. And that is what happened with me. Um, so I after studying uh, classical guitar at the university, at, an, um, at the conservatory, I changed my mind and went into uh, studying uh, cultural history and eventually ended up in the study of religion. And in um, 1995 I uh, finished my dissertation on the New Age movement. Uh, and I tried to place the New Age movement in a wider context of uh, Western esotericism, so the large long range of uh, so-called esoteric currents in Western culture. Um, a couple of years later, I was extremely fortunate uh, that uh, this new chair was created at the University of Amsterdam. And well, after the whole procedure, I was appointed uh, to the chair. And so the, after the, for the last uh, 20 years, I've been holding that chair and we have seen a whole development of the study of Western esotericism, not only at the University of Amsterdam, but at many other places in Europe and elsewhere in the world as well. When I grew up uh, for a long time, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I wasn't sure I wanted to go to the university, uh, but I liked playing guitar. So I decided to, uh, to pursue studies of uh, classical guitar. I went to the university of a town in the Netherlands and studied classical guitar. But uh, halfway through that study, I realized that I did not want to continue for the rest of my life teaching the first beginnings of, of, of guitar. Uh, playing to yeah to beginning students, and I developed an interest in cultural history and intellectual history and history of religion. So I moved on to the University of Utrecht. I studied cultural uh, cultural uh, history there, and in that context, I uh, yeah more or less by chance discovered the field that I now think of as uh, Western esotericism. Yes, well, I was uh, studying cultural history, history of ideas at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands. I wasn't sure entirely what direction I wanted to go. I had certain interests, but basically I was searching for my direction. And one day I, w I happened to be in the university library and I was looking for a book. But as so often happens, there was another book standing next to the one that I was looking for. And this book I just took off the shelf just out of curiosity. That happened to be a, a book about what I would now refer to as Western esotericism. Uh, actually a very important book that is only known in the German speaking world because it has never been translated by Will Erich Peukert, a uh, specialist of folklore and um, Renaissance and early modern studies, uh, who wrote this book called Pansophie, Pansophie, a history of white and black magic, but then in German. And I just was interested, I wanted to know about this book, uh, about the contents of this book, and I started reading it and I discovered that um, it was full of fascinating traditions, starting at the Renaissance, the 15th century, with uh, great thinkers like Marsilio Ficino and Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, and then it went on to Paracelsus and to Jacob Böhme and many other uh, figures that I had never heard about. Uh, and that surprised me because I was wondering why is nobody at the university uh, and nobody at secondary school ever told me about these traditions. Why is this so unknown? And then I began to discover that there were all these traditions that had been sort of neglected uh, or marginalized by mainstream historiography. And um, I wanted to know about them. I got curious. And so that is basically how my interest started. But in combination with another book, uh, there were basically two books. 
de uh, eerste was Wil Erich Poikert Spans Sophie. En de tweede was was a very well a small Dutch volume edited by Gilles Quispel, the specialist of Gnosticism, um, who had edited a book in which he said that there were three main components of Western culture, reason, faith and gnosis. That's how he called it. Well, reason, I understood, was philosophy, science and so on. Faith, I understood it was Christianity and theology and so on. And what was Gnosis? So there was this third component. And I got the feeling this may be the same kind of tradition that Poikert is talking about. And so I got this idea there are three components. And I wanted to know more about what is this Gnosis? What is it? So I started exploring it. And again, I discovered that um, this was a field that had been sort of sidelined and neglected. Of course, people knew about the, the importance of Gnosticism for early Christianity. But the whole further development of Gnosticism and Gnosis and related currents through the centuries, uh, it was very difficult to get adequate and good, reliable information about it. And again, I discovered this seems like a forgotten field. So I got curious, I wanted to explore it. And so basically, basically that happened. My interest in esotericism started out of intellectual curiosity, historical curiosity about things that nobody seemed to be studying. And because that was the case, I thought, I'm going to study it. Well, there are two very important terms in, uh, in this field. One is uh, hermetism or hermeticism. And um, a lot of my work, actually, over the last 20 years has been to revise or try to revise our understanding of what hermetism or hermeticism really means. Because a lot of the research that you find in, in, books, uh, in books and, uh, you know, in studies uh, is based upon a very important study that was published in 1964 by Francis Yates, the great uh, Warburg scholar of the Warburg School who wrote famous books, fantastic books. It started in 1964 uh, with Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, a large book that she published that made her famous. And she talks about the Hermetic Tradition of the Renaissance and that fitted very clearly with the kind of stuff that I was reading about in Poikert and, and, and those other books. Now, the problem with uh, Francis Yates is that she broke open the field of Hermetic studies. She made it possible for this stuff to get uh, studied on an academic level. But at the same time, her research is research from the 1960s. She was a pioneer who discovered everything uh, for the first time, you might say. And most of her uh, assumptions and ideas have been superseded by later scholarship. So the basic idea of the hermetic tradition uh, in many respects is simply incorrect because uh, scholarship has moved on. And so I have been, since I have been working at the, at the chair in Amsterdam, uh, I've again and again, I have had to to reconsider and, and, and revise all kinds of assumptions about what the hermetic tradition was really about. Nowadays, I'm actually working on a book about the topic. I think that the that hermetic tradition was a, well, you might call it a spiritual tradition of antiquity that should be distinguished from religious and philosophical traditions, and uh, which has a very specific uh, nature that you can trace through the centuries. Um, and it would go far, much, much too far to give a whole definition and a description about, about the history of Hermitism. But um, what it's all about is that this is, an, is a tradition of spiritual currents, if you wish, uh, which, uh, lent, which derives its name from a supposed mythical founder, Hermes Trismegistus, and, uh, who was believed to have been an ancient sage living in uh, Egypt and who had started this whole uh, tradition. Uh, there's, of course, there's historically no basis for that. There never was a Hermes Trismegistus, but uh, many writings got uh, attached to his name, and this gave rise to the development of this famous tradition of Hermes. So, yeah, one term is, um, is Hermetism, and another important term is Esotericism. Now, what do we mean by Esotericism? This is a question that has been discussed endlessly over the last 20 or 30 years. There are many uh, answers to it, uh, but I will just give you my answer. I think that esotericism is, can best be understood as a kind of umbrella term, an um, mot autobus, as they say in, uh, in, in French, and a kind of umbrella term um, that covers a lot of heterogeneous different currents that not, not necessarily have a lot to do with each other. Uh, what they do have in common 
is that uh, this kind of tradition, this kind of thinking has been rejected increasingly since the rise of Protestantism in the 16th century and much more strongly after the rise of uh, the Enlightenment and the, seventh, uh, and the Scientific Revolution. So from the 18th century on, what you see is that Enlightenment culture, rationalist Enlightenment scientific culture, basically defines its own identity of what it is all about by distancing itself strongly from everything that it considers esoteric or occult uh, or irrational or mystical and there are all these kind of terms that are being used but the the self-identification of the enlightenment and of modernity uh, requires distancing oneself from everything that is not enlightenment and not modern according to that perspective and uh, so that whole uh, area that whole reservoir of rejected currents basically contains everything that we nowadays study under the term uh, esotericism. So that's the way that I understand the, the these terms as the reservoir of rejected knowledge, uh, a kind of concept that, that uh, has been created since, um, since modernity, since, let's say, since early modernity and since, since the Enlightenment uh, as the other of what is supposed to be, to have to be taken uh, seriously by serious academics and scholars and intellectuals and so on. Now the problem is that uh, this leads to an extremely selective uh, historiography because it basically means that uh, if you write the history of Western culture, you only are supposed to focus on what is what from enlightenment perspectives is seen as rational, serious, scientific and so on. And it leads to a marginalization of all the kind of currents that uh, do not fit those requirements. And that leads to a selective, uh, one-sided uh, picture of Western culture. Because if you actually look more closely, then you find that a lot of the esoteric currents of the past, things like astrology and alchemy and magical currents and so on and so forth, that they actually um, are much more complex than you would think if you read what, uh, what Enlightenment um, critics and enemies of those currents have to say about them. So what we're trying to do is, uh, is, is construct a one-sided historiography that has sidelined and marginalized and rejected all these currents, try to put them back on the table and see how our view of Western culture changes if you uh, include those traditions. I was born in Amsterdam, this is my city. It has often said that it is uh, very appropriate that this chair for history of hermetic philosophy and related currents exists here in the city of Amsterdam. Uh, the same city, by the way, where we also have the Ritman Library, the Bibliotheca Philosophica Hermetica, that nowadays uh, you know, presents itself as the embassy of the free mind. And that says a lot. So we are very proud of those traditions of tolerance and positive acceptance of pluralism and so on. And I think there is something to that picture. The Netherlands, Amsterdam and the Netherlands as a whole have been a kind of a place, a kind of haven uh, of freedom, relatively speaking, during the 17th century. It was possible for many uh, thinkers who were dissident and uh, had to fear for their freedom or their life, it was possible to find a refuge here in the Netherlands and, and in Amsterdam. So there's truth to that notion. Uh, and I think it has something to do it's why there is this tradition of tolerance in the Netherlands. There are many reasons, but uh, one thing I think that helps explain it is the specific type of Calvinism that uh, was dominant in the Netherlands. It's because Calvinists, uh, well, believe in predestination. So that means that whether you go to heaven or you go to hell is decided by God. And this means that, well, the Net Dutchmen were uh, were traders, they were business people, they had to do business with people from many other faiths and uh, traditions. Well, if you want to uh, make business, then it isn't doesn't make much sense to start fighting with them about their religion. Uh, so you'd better be peaceful with them and just do your business with them. And you have good reasons to do so because you can try to convert them. But it doesn't make much difference because predestination means that they will either be damned or be saved anyway, you know, no matter what you do. So that leads to a kind of pragmatic 
kind of tolerance, if you want to call it tolerance, you might also call it a certain indifference. Um, that uh, I think is one of the reasons for this famous tolerance of the Netherlands. At the same time, I, I also have to say that uh, I was still raised, uh, I was born in 1961, I was raised in this climate where tolerance was very highly regarded in the Netherlands. I think that over the last 20 years or so, we have seen this tradition decline. The Netherlands and Amsterdam still has the reputation of tolerance, but I'm afraid that the reality has, uh, is no longer uh, entirely in line with that perception. Uh, we have seen the rise of intolerance, like we see in many other countries. Uh, we see that in the Netherlands also. And um, personally, I worry about it. I think that uh, uh, one of the reasons I like the study of esotericism is that it focuses on traditions and ways of thinking, etc., that are often politically incorrect, to use that term, that are often not, uh, not acceptable by the mainstream, but that have to be tolerated, and that have, have to be given their place in the whole of our culture. So I think studying esotericism means being interested in ideas and currents and the traditions that used to be suppressed and marginalized. And obviously, as scholars of, uh, of that field, we are not very much in favor of those kind of repressive attitudes. Well, our uh, chair started in 1999, so we had to build up the whole field, uh, you know, basically from the beginning. And we reached the year 2005, which was a very important pivotal year for us, because one reason was that at that year we published a large uh, dictionary of Gnosis and Western Esotericism, large 1200 page, two volume reference work that basically showed what the st study of esotericism was all about. And in that same year, we also uh, founded European organization, the European Society for the Study of Western Esotericism, the ESWI, as we now call it. This society was founded more or less almost yeah, on a whim during a meeting in southern France, uh, a meeting at the, at the residence of the woman who has been responsible for founding, uh, for making financially possible the creation of the chair uh, in Amsterdam, uh, Rosalie Baston. We basically owe it all to her. She has a wonderful residence in southern France where she invites people, uh, scholars in the fields so from time to time. So we were there with a group of 12 people or so and we decided it's time to found a, a society uh, for the study of esotericism. So that's what we did. That's where it started. Um, and it has been continuing ever since. Um, it is the European S Society for the Study of Western Esotericism. It accepts uh, members from all over the world, so not only Europeans. Uh, Americans or people from, from all over the world are very, very welcome, and we have many members from other continents. But our conferences are organized in Europe, and we have had uh, seven now. Uh, the first was in 2007 in Germany, in Tübingen, and that was focused on, on the tradition, the notion of tradition in esotericism. Then 2009, um, we had a conference in uh, Strasbourg in France about cities of esotericism, capitals of esotericism. Then in 2011, we went to Hungary, to Zeget, where we focused on the, on the visual and the symbolic in Western esotericism. 2013, Gothenburg in Sweden, we studied, um, we focused on uh, Western esotericism and health. Then we went to Riga, and there we had a conference about Western esotericism and the East. Then, uh, two years ago, there was a conference in Erfurt, again in Germany, on uh, Western esotericism and deviance. And now, this year, in, uh, in 2019, we have our seventh conference uh, here in Amsterdam, uh, focused on Western esotericism and consciousness, visions, voices, altered states. So here we are foc focusing very much on the whole uh, new research that is going on, on consciousness research, with a special focus on so-called altered states of consciousness or alterations of consciousness, uh, all kinds of trance-like modified uh, states of consciousness, which are often very important 
uh, in the study of esotericism because when people receive revelations, visions, they hear voices of divine beings and so on and so forth, very often this happens in altered states of consciousness and we are trying to study how this works. So we try to integrate historical research into esoteric currents with um, theoretical approaches from cognitive studies, psychologies, etc. to try to understand better uh, how that works and what is happening in uh, yeah, in the field of esotericism and consciousness. There often is, is the question, uh, how did this chair in Amsterdam get founded? How did it get created? Well, this is thanks to an uh, extremely, uh, well, a brilliant idea and a generous donation that was given by uh, a Dutch woman, Rosalie Boston, who basically came up with the idea of founding a chair for history of hermetic philosophy and related currents and also had the financial means of making it possible. Rosalie Boston had a personal interest in esoteric currents for a long time and um, she had been trying before to see whether there might be an interest in, in an academic context for creating a scholarly context for studying esotericism. And she had studied philosophy herself and she had been disappointed that uh, esoteric currents played no role in the academy. So she wanted to do something about it. She approached, well, the right people around 1997 in the University of Amsterdam. Her plan, her proposal was taken up with great enthusiasm. And um, well, basically this is how it became possible, uh, how the chair was founded in 1999. Crescent, we have, um, an, uh, we have a small group, uh, one full professor and two associate professors, uh, two PhD students and a secretary. And that is enough to, um, to run a program on the bachelor, the master and the research master levels. So we have, an, we have a program for esotericism in the context of the study of religion on the bachelor level. We have a complete one year program Western esotericism and then it's also possible for students who are doing the one year MA and who are good enough to extend and expand their, uh, their program to a two year research master program which gives them access in principle to, uh, to moving forward for doing a PhD. So the SWE um, has been running now since 2005 uh, very well. It, it has become an extremely vital, lively network of scholars uh, from all over the world studying in this field. I think the SWE has set standards also for uh, scholarly excellence, uh, which was very important. Um, I might also mention that um, one of the most interesting and exciting parts of the SWE is that we have networks in the SWE, a part of the SWE. So for instance, you have a network of scholars specializing in uh, esotericism in antiquity or contemporary esotericism, or esotericism in the arts, or esotericism in uh, Eastern Europe, for instance, and, and many others. So there are all these specialized networks which do their own thing, uh, organize their own conferences as part, so to speak, of the mothership of the SWE. Um, so it is not only the SWE, it is all the networks that are related to it, and new networks are created all the time. So this makes it an extremely vital and complex but very interesting um, uh, organization which has been uh, working together uh, successfully with most of the important international organizations in the study of religion. So then I'm mentioning especially the American Academy of Religion, um, the IAHR, the International Association for the History of Religions, and uh, other organizations of that kind as the European Association for the Study of Religion. So the SWE is an affiliate uh, organization of these organizations. There are always all kinds of collaborations between them and that makes it possible for uh, the study of esotericism to get integrated in a very effective manner with other networks and other domains in the academy. Well, part of, part of this whole setup, the SWE and the chair in Amsterdam, is that it makes possible all kinds of exchange, you know, between uh, scholars in the SWE or specifically in Amsterdam and scholars in other universities. So there are exchange programs, uh, so a professor at one university can spend, uh, spend some time, for, for instance, at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, we have quite a number of postdoc researchers who are spending 
a shorter or longer period of time at the University of Amsterdam um, and so on and so forth. So there is quite a lot going on in terms of exchange and interconnection with other, other universities. This is also important in the present uh, international situation of scholarship uh, because a lot depends on, uh, on getting grants and getting, um, getting funding for, a <laughs> for research projects. And, this, and in this uh, situation also, I think that at the University of Amsterdam we have been able to uh, make it possible for quite a number of scholars to uh, get funding yeah, because they have gone through a program or we know them from the SRE context, so we can write recommendation letters for them and so on and so forth. And um, quite a number of projects have been funded in this way, so you can see that there is a whole self-generating process going on and it's a, what we've seen over the last 20 years is how important it is is to have at least one uh, well-recognized um, serious program well in this case in Amsterdam that shows that a field of study like esotericism is serious uh, is scholarly is academically well accepted and that gives uh, our program a kind of, kind of authority that makes it possible to support uh, projects elsewhere um, and, and support scholars who are working in other parts of the world. In the 1960s, the first chair was founded, uh, and that was an isolated chair at the École Pratique des Hautes-Études at uh, Sorbonne in Paris, and that was held by, first by François Secret and then by uh, Antoine Fèvre. And uh, since, um, since the beginning of, of this century, it has been held by Jean-Pierre Braque. So that was the first uh, chair. Uh, but there was not a complete uh, teaching program yet. So the chair in Amsterdam was the first that had a complete teaching program on all the levels, bachelor, master and PhD. There have been several other programs. Um, one of them, very unfortunately, has been discontinued. That was a chair at the University of Exeter in England, uh, held by uh, Nicholas Guthrie Clark, who sadly uh, died and that was the end of the program. Since then we have had, uh, had several other, um, other programs developing, uh, especially in Scandinavia. There is, an, there is a lot of, uh, uh, lot of possibilities at the University of Gothenburg in, the, in Sweden and nowadays also at the University of Stockholm for instance. Um, so in Europe, at, at various places, uh, you can study esotericism uh, to a larger or a smaller extent. Sometimes it's just one or two courses, sometimes it's a larger uh, offering. Um, in the United States, at this moment, to my knowledge, there is one program that really uh, focuses very much on esotericism. That's at the University, at Rice University in uh, Houston, uh, where they have a program called Gnosticism, Esotericism, Mysticism, GEM, G-E-M. Uh, in which uh, Jeff Kripal is the central figure. Um, so these are the programs that are in existence at the moment. So the number of uh, specialized programs on esotericism is still very small and limited, but, um, but actually the actual, uh, the actual amount of activity, if you look at uh, courses that are being offered, has been expanding uh, very, very fast over the last, I'd say, I would say, 15 to 20 years. At the program in Amsterdam, um, basically students come from all kinds of directions. Uh, our own program is situated in the study of, uh, of religion, but actually uh, the study of esotericism is, a, is an extremely interdisciplinary program. Um, so we get students from uh, study of religion, from history, from philosophy, from uh, art history, sometimes from, from musicology, of course uh, from the social sciences, uh, not to forget. Uh, so basically they come from all over the place. Uh, then they enter our program and in our program we put a strong emphasis on historical research. So we study the history uh, of esoteric currents in especially the Western context. Um, so that's, that, that's what we do. Um, so what we offer to students is uh, not some kind of spiritual guidance uh, because sometimes people think, sometimes uh, from time to time it happens that students enter our program and think that we have some kind of esoteric 
uh, school. Like uh, we are sometimes jokingly we say we are not Hogwarts, right? We are not a school of magic. We are not we are not teaching you esotericism. We are teaching you how to study esotericism in an uh, in an academic fashion according to standards, historical and other uh, other academic approaches. So what we have to offer is. Um, um, information, knowledge, understanding about dimensions of Western culture that are usually not treated and not given attention at other programs. So what we offer is an, an, is an enriched, a broader, a more complex and I would say an also more fascinating and more interesting picture of the enormous uh, treasures of thought, of traditions, of thinking, uh, especially in Western culture. Well, that's a very interesting question. There are in in contemporary um, yeah practice, occult practice, occultist practice. There are of course all kinds of techniques that people use uh, that can have a very strong impact on the mind. For instance, there are techniques that specifically train the imagination, uh, how to imagine things very vi very vividly. Um, and there are other other techniques um, uh, that have an impact on the mind. Um, it is true that uh, some of these techniques are very powerful and um, uh, I know cases from personal acquaintance from people that I've met and also occasionally from a few students in our program and in other programs, uh, people who have been experimenting with let's say mental techniques that had such an impact that uh, they got very confused. And um, so I think it is true that some of these techniques can have a strong impact on the mind. And if, if your own mental stability is not sufficient, then it can sometimes have dangerous effects. Um, so I think this is an important aspect that has to be taken seriously and has not been studied as thoroughly, as far as I know, in the study of esotericism as it should be. So I think this is an important uh, topic. Generally speaking, I would say that I have seen a number of cases of mental problems with students um, in several programs, not necessarily in esotericism, but also in our own programs. And um, yes, these are, these are important issues. So how do these techniques work? What kind of impact do they have? And what kind of safety measures do you have to have in place in order to avoid, uh, avoid problems? Are there certain techniques that uh, certain people should better not practice and so on and so forth. Um, this is not the kind of thing that we um, study uh, seriously in a systematic manner in our program. We are primarily historians. We are studying the history of these things. But of course we, we take these dimensions seriously. And um, I personally think that more attention should be given to this, to this dimension of the field. There's sometimes the question, um, yeah, what about issues such as secrecy and secret oral, oral teachings? Isn't that what esotericism is, is all about? Uh, there's, there are quite, there's quite some literature that defines esotericism as based upon secret teachings that are transmitted to an elite and are, that, are, that often have to do with, uh, with experiences that are difficult or impossible to express in language. Um, this is the kind of uh, movement that you associate in antiquity with, with the Pythagoreans, for instance. Um, uh, so this idea of esotericism and secret teachings. It's important to understand that if we study esotericism in our context, this is just one of the many forms of esotericism that we study. Many uh, esoteric currents through the centuries, according to our understanding of the field, um, are not necessarily secret and are not necessarily uh, focused only on an elite of initiates. So this is one aspect, uh, but it is, uh, the, it, it's only one aspect in a much broader field and it doesn't define what esotericism is all about.
Yeah, one of my uh, personal favorites, uh, and I've written a book about him, is an, um, f a 15th century uh, Italian um, hermitist uh, whose name was Lodovico Lazzarelli. I found him very interesting because um, he had been uh, forgotten and overlooked almost entirely. Uh, what happens in the second half of the 15th century is that the hermetic literature from antiquity, the writings attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, are rediscovered and translated into Latin. And this is done by the great famous uh, philosopher uh, uh, Ficino, Marsilio Ficino. Now, in all the accounts of the history of Hermetism, uh, from the Renaissance on, it's always Ficino who takes the first place and who is seen as the big hero of the recovery of Hermitism. Um, but I looked more closely into this matter and I discovered something strange, and that is that um, Ficino himself was not so terribly interested in the Hermetic literature, much less than people think. He translated the Corpus Hermeticum, he used some of the ideas here and there, but he was basically much more interested in Plato and other Platonic thinkers. And I discovered that, uh, that if you look for a true Hermetic philosopher in the Renaissance, it was not Ficino, but it was this guy, uh, Lodovico Lazzarelli, whom nobody knew, who had been totally forgotten. Uh, but Lazzarelli was, an, um, yeah, was a humanist thinker who discovered Hermetic literature and who became a pupil of a strange wandering preacher, Giovanni da Corizio a kind of a strange figure who believed that he was the Messiah who had to save the world and prepare everybody for the coming end of time. And this Correggio, the master of Lodovico Lazzarelli, at one point started thinking of himself as Hermes uh, Trismegistus returned to earth and at the same time as Christ as well. So you had a kind of this strange figure who was wandering through Italy and who saw himself as the Hermetic Christ, and Lazzarelli was his main, main pupil. Now Lazzarelli uh, followed Correggio, he believed that the end of time was coming, and um, he was totally captivated by the message of the Hermetic literature um, that he had found, um, found in independent manuscripts, and, um, and he, he, he combined this with his own understanding of, of, uh, of Christian theology. Now Lazzar Lazzarelli's Hermetic message was much more subtle, much more profound, I would say, than uh, what we find in Ficino. I would say only as, as regards Ficino's interest in Hermetism. Um, so I spent a lot of time reading Lazzarelli, uh, translating his work into English, and uh, what you see in the case of uh, Lazzarelli is that the Hermetic literature is entirely about an inner process, an internal process of uh, transformation of rebirth, of inner rebirth, um, that will lead to a salvation. So for him it was not about philosophy so much, he was not terribly interested in philosophy. He was interested in personal spiritual transformation and he, he believed it that, that Hermetic literature uh, gave the key for uh, teaching people how to transform themselves in such a way that they would find a way back to um, unity with God himself. And this is a forgotten, fascinating figure, Lazzarelli, whom I think is actually at the very heart and at the very center of the real Hermetic tradition, as opposed to the Hermetic tradition that most people think about. Esotericism and Revelation. Well, I think the only way for me as an historian to talk about revelation is by understanding it as talking about revelations in the plural. Simply the fact that there are people who, uh, who receive revelations or are convinced that they receive revelations because God speaks to them or an angel speaks to them or perhaps even a demon speaks to them. They see visions, they hear voices and so on and so forth. Um, so they receive revelations. Uh, that have authority for them. Well, this happens all the time in the history of esotericism from antiquity to the present. And um, uh, I'm particularly interested myself, uh, like many of my colleagues, in how revelations take place. How do they happen? And I think a key uh, dimension of this is uh, alterations of consciousness. Uh, typically people get into uh, an altered state, an unusual state of consciousness, and then under those conditions uh, something happens to them, they see something, they hear something, etc. 
I recently wrote a book, uh, read a book, uh, I recently read a book, very interesting uh, on this topic by uh, Julia Ustinova, who is the, uh, one of the keynote speakers uh, at our conference at the ESWI in Amsterdam, uh, who talks, just, give, just to give one example, who talks about um, the experience of entering caves in ancient Greece. Very interesting. Uh, we know that people have been entering into caves to pray and to meditate, and in many cultures, not only in Greece, but think of uh, Mohammed, the prophet Mohammed, who went into a cave. And there, uh, that is where, uh, where, where he met uh, the angel who gave him the revelation of the Quran. Uh, what happens if you enter a cave? Well, it's extremely dark there and it is extremely silent. Uh, a kind of silent and darkness that is hard for us, us to imagine in our uh, image saturated and sound saturated world. Uh, but people enter into a very, very quiet place, no sound, no light, no visuals. And what happens then is that, that the human brain starts to compensate. Uh, for the state of sensory deprivation. Um, if you do not get external um, um, impressions on your senses, then the brain will compensate and it will produce visions and voices. And I think this is one of the perspectives that are interesting for, for understanding how, re how revelations take place. Somebody is sitting there in total silence, in total darkness, and starts to see what maybe psychologically or psychiatrically you could describe as hallucinations. That's maybe a pejorative term. But what, means, what it means is that people see, see, see visions and they hear voices. And of course, what they see is often mediated and conditioned by their cultural uh, upbringing. So if you're uh, living in ancient Greece, then it's, it's a good chance that you will see the ancient Greek gods. If you're, living in, uh, if you're a Buddhist living in I don't know, Sri Lanka, you will probably see Buddhist the deities. But um, this is an example of how consciousness research can help us understand how revelations take place in esotericism and in other contexts. Yeah, nowadays we see a lot of techniques and practices that uh, are, uh, are concerned with well-being, with personal development, with healing and so on and so forth. This is often associated with new age and so on. And often a lot of money is being made by these practices, but they're very popular. Um, so the question that's often asked is, um, do these practices actually come from esoteric traditions? And in what sense? And I think there are strong, strong connections here. It is only one dimension of esotericism. There's much more to esotericism, but it is an important dimension. If you go back to antiquity, and especially late antiquity is the foundation for all the esoteric currents that we are studying, then, um, well, the French scholar Pierre Hadot has given a lot of attention to philosophy as a way of life. And he emphasized that philosophy in antiquity was not only about uh, theories, about theorizing, uh, as we now, nowadays tend to think about, uh, but philosophy had to do with a way of life, with cultivating a way of an optimal way of living. And um, there are, I think, strong, strong connections between the kind of dimensions that Hado and others are talking about in antiquity and the kind of things that you uh, encounter nowadays, for instance, in uh, practices like mindfulness and meditation. There are strong connections and that's interesting. And there's another good example I'm thinking of. Um, I earlier mentioned uh, Marcello Ficino, the 15th century philosopher, who basically uh, is at the bottom of the revival of Platonism and of, of the Hermetic tradition in the Renaissance. He was experimenting, and he writes about it, he was experimenting with, with what we nowadays might call a kind of holistic healing type of method. He was himself very much concerned about his own well-being and, and about his own health. He was getting older, he was an intellectual, he was prone to depression and he wanted to stay healthy. And he was uh, wondering what can we do, how can we, uh, can, can we cultivate um, uh, a way of life uh, that makes it possible for intellectuals to stay healthy. And he had a whole astrological regime for doing that, which had to do with attracting the powers of the planets, uh, because he strongly believed in astrology, by surrounding yourself by, um, by, um, by all kinds of stuff that uh, corresponded with the powers of the planets. So you would surround yourself with the right uh, images, 
with the right smells, with the right perfumes, you would, and uh, you would sing the right songs, etc., etc., make the right kind of movements, and all these things would be yeah, rid your life in such a way as to harmonize your life with the life of the heavens. That's the way he thought about it. There is a uh, total perfect harmony up above and the human beings can learn to live in such a way that their life coincides and harmonizes with the harmony of the heavens. That is what he was trying to do by using, um, using uh, uh, astrological, magical and all kinds of, uh, kind of related traditions that you find in hermitism, that you find in um, in the Platonic tradition and so forth. And here also, if you see what he was actually doing, he was, uh, I think, doing something quite similar to what you see uh, people in the holistic health movement and related to, uh, currents, what you see people doing today.